Hi, this is Chris the Guitar Amp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we'll be continuing our not so short series where we look at the contributors to Tube Amp SAG. SAG is a concert of interacting elements that has been misunderstood by many people. And I'm going to do my best to remove some of the mysteries of SAG. Today is chapter five. The Transformer, Transformer. Effect. Effect. If this sounds like something you may be interested in, grab a coffee, pull up a chair, and let's get stuck in. In previous chapters, we investigated the impact of SAG by rectifiers, capacitors, and also looked at the differences and similarities between compression and clipping. Today, we will look at the transformer, the transformer effect. 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 Transformers are expensive. It's the laminated iron core, the thickness and length of the copper windings. Have you picked up a Mesa Boogie Mark I and thought, why is this thing so damned heavy? Well, working on Mesa ramps is often a pain in the ass, but they use quality components and they don't cut corners on transformers. Look behind a Mark I and you'll see two massive transformers. If I were ever to meet Mesa's Randall Smith, I would be tempted to leap at his throat on behalf of all Amtex on the planet. But the truth is that Randall understands that kilos of iron equals tone. Transformers are a complex item, and we will take a simplified view of three elements of transformers. The inrush current used to energize the transformers magnetic flux. We'll briefly look over magnetic flux and define that. And we'll also look at the internal resistance of the transformer we won't be discussing uh, eddy currents and hysteresis. And, uh, important factors for sure, but not critical in our scope of the causes of tube amp sag. So let's begin with the transformer's inrush current. In chapter three, we had a look at the inrush current caused by filter capacitors. It's critical that we take this effect into account before we smoke our rectifier tubes. If you don't recall how the capacitor looks like a short circuit for the blink of an eye, you might want to revise that chapter. But when we turn on the power switch, we will see another big inrush current from the power transformer. Yes, the transformers are before the rectifier, so we aren't at risk of hooking, cooking the rectifier tube, but it is a powerful current surge nonetheless. This inrush current happens during the rapid energizing of the power transformer. The transformer inrush current is a large transient spike that can be 10 times the steady state current. This will only last for a few cycles of AC mains as the current is rapidly developing the magnetic flux that is in the core of the transformer needed to do its job. <sighs> Not sure you believe me about inrush current? Well, let's have a look. A digital display is great for most purposes when it comes to accuracy. But when you need to see the rate of change of something, nothing beats an analog meter. Hmm, rate of change. Does that term ring a bell from high school days or uni days? Hmm, we'll come back to this. Have you got yours yet? Do I need to remind you that coffee always tastes better out of a seafoam green cup? Give it a try. Filter capacitors can either be on the rectifier side of the standby switch or on the um, output transformer side of the standby switch.
Um, fenders often have them on the rectifier side. Um, this one has it on the other side. And the reason I wanted to pick this is because I wanted to isolate the capacitors from the startup transformer uh, surge that we'll see, the inrush current from the transformer. All right, now if you keep your eye on the meter here, you will see two um, inrushes. First one will be when we go from off, power off, to power on, and that will be the transformer energizing. That will be the transformer inrush current. Then I'll go from standby to play, and that will be our filter capacitors charging. Okay, here we go, power on. Now you saw that little uh, pulse in current, that was our transformer energizing, and then settles back down to almost zero. Now let's try it, uh, going from standby to play mode. And you saw that much larger pulse in this case, that was our filter capacitors charging up. As we said, it almost looks like a short circuit when you first power it on. And so that we saw two inrush currents, transformer, capacitors. Hmm, rate of change. Does that term ring a bell from high school or uni days? The mathematical term for the rate of change is derivative. This is the only bit of maths that I'm going to show you. Mm. See if I'm green. Always better. This little equation is from Faraday's law and it relates the induced voltage to the magnitude of the change of flux over time, over the change in time. Basically, it means that the rate of change of theta, that's the magnetic flux, in the core of the transformer is directly related to the primary voltage, which in turn relates to the magnetizing current. When the voltage is first applied to the transformer, the flux will start to build up very, very quickly. The voltage will go from zero to maximum in a couple of cycles and the current will be very large. The transformer flux may briefly saturate and it's in this time that bad things can happen. Once the magnetic flux reaches a steady state and the change in theta is zero, then the change in voltage will return to a small value. As you can see, if the time taken in the change of magnetic flux can be extended, make this larger, then that will reduce that induced voltage and the inrush current. So we could use like a NTC negative temperature coefficient thermistor and that will reduce, uh, by increasing that time to charge, it will reduce that um, voltage and in turn the current. Now let's have a look at another transformer, the output transformer this time, and you'll be familiar with this format where we have a center tap um, output transformer on the primary side and it goes to a push-pull configuration. And so let's, for simplicity's sake, just look at the DC version. And that's going to have twice the plate current coming into the center tap and it's twice because we split that plate current into the two halves. Let's simplify this a bit more and we'll just look at half of that output transformer. We've got the B plus coming into the center tap, IP plate current going through the internal resistance of the transformer and out to the plate. So the plate voltage at quiescence isn't actually B plus, it's B plus less the current flowing through the internal resistance times that resistance. So B plus, uh, so the voltage at the plate is B plus minus RT times IP. At maximum current draw, 
our VP max current draw is going to be B plus minus RT times IP max. So this is obviously going to be a smaller number of VP max compared to this one because IP max is bigger. So we'll have a smaller voltage plate. So we can write it this way. So the change in plate voltage is the voltage at quiescence minus the voltage at maximum current draw. So we got B plus minus basically this minus this it gives us uh, the uh, change in plate voltage is um, resistance times quiescence minus IP max. So that gives you a pretty clear indication that the voltage, the change in voltage is directly related to the size of the internal resistance. So if you wanted to have a larger voltage drop, more sag at your plate, then you would look for a transformer with a larger internal resistance. Is it that easy? No, it's not. Because we also know that I squared R is equivalent to the power loss in that uh, transformer. And that will appear as heat. We also know that heat is bad for a transformer because around each one of those copper wires and which there's hundreds of turns, there is insulating uh, enamel and that will soften as the temperature goes up. Eventually, uh, you might get a rupture in that coating. And if two, contact, if two points of that winding come into contact, we're going to have a problem. And the transformer will instantly go, ooh, or it's going to short out a couple of winds and things are going to start to go south from there. Yes, there are other contributing elements at play in a tube amp sag such as the screen grid. When the amp is in pentode mode, the sag from the winding resistance is not as significant because the plate current is affected more by the screen voltage. In triode mode, the plate voltage will have more of a direct effect on sag. So how are we going? Any questions so far? Uh, yes, Mr. Bonk. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, look, if you didn't hear that, James Bonk asked the question, if the transformers have a direct impact on SAG. Yes, but it's an expensive component to experiment with. And for most of us, Transformer sag caused by the DC resistance of the windings of both the output and power transformers will be a preset condition of operation. Yes, Mr. Smartass. Yes, yes. So you've heard about transformer saturation and want to know if it's a good thing. Uh, good question. But before I answer that question, we have to consider the effect of different transformers, different power transformers, in an identical circuit. Let's take a look at the famous Fender Blackface AB763 circuit, virtually identical in the Bandmaster and the Tremolux. Yet the Bandmaster is louder and cleaner and punchier than the Tremolux. Even though they both have the same circuit, they both use 6L6s. Best let's take a look at the power transformer spec from Hammond. You can see that the secondary voltage for the bandmaster is slightly higher, less than 2% than the Tremolux, which will give an almost imperceptible increase in headroom. But look at the current, 275 milliamps in the Bandmaster, 180 milliamps for the Tremolux transformer. It may not seem like much, but that's actually 50% more current capacity 
When the musician demands extra volume from his amp, the bandmaster can supply the extra current through the power valves, where the tremolux may not. The tremolux power valves will be starved of that additional current demand. This starvation of power is akin to compression, and compression, as we know, is a form of sag, as we discussed back in chapter one. So now let's revisit the term saturation in reference to transformers. You remember that the voltage induces a magnetic flux in the transformer core, which then um, induces the current in the secondary coil. So if we simplify things and say there's a linear relationship between current, voltage and magnetic flux. As the player asks more of his amp, the current through the output transformer, which is directly supplied by the power transformer, will be asked to increase. This increases the current demand on the secondary of the power transformer. This is reflected back into the primary by an increased magnetic flux. To maintain the power transformer's secondary voltage, it will ask the primary side to draw more current from the mains supply. As the demand on the power transformer increases, there will be a point when no more magnetic flux can be produced. The core becomes saturated with magnetic flux. At this point, negative things start to happen in the transformer. The secondary voltage will no longer be sinusoidal. When it's no longer sinusoidal, that means the transformer is now creating harmonics above the mains 50 or 60 hertz. These higher frequencies are causing overheating because the transformer was just not designed to handle more than mains frequencies, low frequencies. As the transformer gets hotter, it loses efficiency, it loses power. Now, this is not SAG because a power transformer has a very large thermal mass and it does not shed its heat quickly or easily. The transformer cannot cool fast enough for the voltage to recover to provide the squishy compression that we want. This heat is also softening and weakening the insulation of the copper wire as we discussed earlier. So imagine you're playing a long, loud gig. As the night progresses, you notice that your amp will slowly deteriorate in volume, headroom, and the notes will start to smear. Your transformer is probably saturating. So you're asking, well, why did Leo put in an undersized transformer in the Tremolux? Well, of course, partly it's cost, but everything is built to a compromise. The Tremolux wasn't undersized, it was sized. In fact, you can get more power out of a bandmaster if you used an even bigger power transformer. Today, we also need to look at allowable venue volumes and the weight of an amp becomes more significant. In my opinion, the Tremolux is probably better fit for today's gigs, but times change and the sad truth is most modern mass produced amp makers are run by accountants and not by engineers. And the transformers here are often genuinely undersized. This is why upgrading your transformers in one of the budget amps can improve your tone. But iron and copper cost a lot, as does shipping heaps of iron from the USA or Canada to Australia. In summary, let's revisit our opening question. Can transformers contribute to tube amp sag? The answer is a definitive maybe yes. 
the internal resistance can cause plate voltage to reduce, uh, which will reduce the output power, which is a contributor to sag. However, continued transformer saturation can lead to overheating and transformer failure. That was a pretty full on chapter. I hope you got something out of it. We did a fair bit just to prove the point that transformers don't contribute too much to SAG. So, um, but we need to know these things. So if you got something out of it, could you please hit subscribe and like if you haven't already. And um, it just helps uh, YouTube know that I have been of service to you. And um, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next time when we're going to continue the series. We're going to be looking at the effect of biasing and the two different types of bias, cathode bias and fixed bias, and see how they impact on tube, amp, sag. And I'll see you then.